Thank you for letting me be here with you. And this is um, going to work a bit better if we can start with me asking you to close your eyes. And now imagine a wilderness. Make it a jungle. It has to be a place you've never been and you're not quite sure why you're there or how you got there. You look around and it's lush and green and there are plants everywhere. And there are animals or maybe other people. You can't see them for the plants, but you can feel them watching you. And you start to hear their voices. They're whispering, but if you listen, you'll know that they're speaking to you. And they tell you that you shouldn't be there and you should leave. So you turn around, you plan to leave, but it looks the same from every side and there is no path. And suddenly it gets quiet and you have a very bad feeling. You turn around again and what you thought was a branch behind you is now an enormous snake. It's looking at you and as you stare at each other, you begin to feel the snake insert itself into your thoughts. And you realize that that jungle must be the Garden of Eden and that snake must be Satan because now you know you are there to eat the fruit. There's an apple appears in front of you and although you're not sure you want to do it, you're not sure it's safe, you don't feel that your decisions are yours anymore. So you reach out your hand, grab the fruit, bring it to your mouth, and take a bite. Open your eyes. Sound a little crazy. It sounds kind of odd even to say it. That's the wilderness of psychosis. And among the many things that we do not understand about psychotic illnesses, one is that almost no one hallucinates a happy thing. I have never had a patient come into my clinic and tell me, that they had an unremitting voice in their head over and over telling them, you looked fabulous this week. <laughs> the hallucinations are almost always negative. They're threatening. They make demands. They make people uncomfortable. And the delusions that accompany them very frequently have a paranoid quality. People feel that they're being watched. They're being threatened. They're stalked. They often have a religious or a supernatural component and people begin to feel that their thoughts are not their own and they're not in control of their actions or their behaviors. So that's the wilderness of psychosis. Close your eyes again. Let's take a look at another landscape. This time, imagine a place that you do know, a place that you've always loved, where you felt comfortable, happy, relaxed, maybe even joyful. And it could be a beach, a forest, a lakeside, a garden. Put in some of the detail, the reason that you feel happy there. And now, slowly, begin to extract that detail. Take away the color, take away the blues, the greens, make it all gray. And if there's any life in your landscape, take that away. Take away the plants, the animals, no trees, no flowers, not even the grass, so that it's a lifeless landscape. And you know as you look at it that if you stay in that place, it will drain your energy from you. That's the landscape of depression. Open your eyes. Given that depression will affect about one in 10 people, the odds are good that some of you in this room have been to that place before. It might not have been quite that gray or entirely lifeless, but it was getting there. And you might have had to work hard, you might have got help, you might have just got lucky and the color came back. But the odds are that someone here has looked out on a landscape that has been gray and lifeless and understood that as a metaphor for their own existence. When people are acutely unwell, they often don't realize what's happening. They know they're off the path, they know they're in unfamiliar territory, but they don't realize that their experiences are being influenced by an illness. 
Even those of us who work in the field don't always realize it. So I have a colleague, a brilliant psychiatrist, and after the birth of her first child, she took a chair, she found the one spot in her house where she could see all the doors and the stairs up to the baby's room, and she sat there for days at a time. And it took a while to get agreement on the idea that in-home baby theft was not, in fact, a top-of-mind concern for all conscientious new parents. <laughs> so what I'm asking you today is to consider the idea that the wilderness inside all of us is the strangest place to be and the worst place to be lost. You might recognize it in a colleague at work who used to be fine and has now checked out. We call that being absent at work presenteeism and it costs the economy a lot of money. Or you might know a teenager who used to be a nice kid and now you really don't want him anywhere near your house. That kid is lost and somebody has to go and find him. When people are acutely unwell, whether they're psychotic or manic, depressed, intoxicated, delirious, their thoughts are not their own. Their emotions are dysregulated all over the map. And their behavior can be unpredictable and it can be frightening. It's not politically correct these days to say that. The idea is that there's enough stigma that we don't need to use the words mentally ill and scary in the same sentence. But the reality is that it can be frightening for the person who's experiencing it, for the family members who don't know where their loved one is, and sometimes even for those of us who go out to find them. But it's also an exciting field. It's almost a cliche to say that the brain is really the final frontier in medicine. But inside each of us is a whole world, and we're beginning to be able to map those worlds. And we actually mean that literally. We call it brain mapping. Here you see images of brains from different perspectives, from the outside in, from the top down, and from the inside out. And what these are essentially a composite of about 100 people who have gone into an MRI scanner about half of them had depression, and the other half went in as healthy controls. And when we compare the groups, we see that the outer surface of the brain, the cortex of the brain, is thinner in people who have depression, particularly in the front. That's the blue part and the top or the front that you're seeing. That area is important for high-level cognitive processing, for decision-making and for planning. We call it executive function, and that area is thinner in people with depression, and to our surprise, particularly in those who first experienced depression under the age of 25. The group that was somewhat older when they first got depression had much more illness by the time they got into the scanner, but it was the young people who had the greatest thinning, and that points us towards something that we probably should have known, which is that while it is important to try to prevent depression on a population level, it may be especially important in adolescents and young adults because those are the brains that are still plastic. They're still developing and they're the most vulnerable to the toxic effects of illness. This is a region of the brain, a specific region called the hippocampus or the little seahorse. It's my favorite area of the brain. And the hippocampus is important for a number of things. It's critically important in controlling the stress response. So any of us today who've had our stress hormones elevated, it's the hippocampus that's gonna be the first place in the brain to detect that, try to bring it down. It's also important for modulating emotions and setting a context to tell you is that emotion right for that place and time. And certain forms of memory are completely dependent on the integrity of the hippocampus. And I'll tell you a little story so you understand this kind of memory. So there's an older couple and they're beginning to worry a bit about their memory so they decide to go to their family physician and get checked out. And he checks them out and he tells them that they're fine but they might want to start writing things down to help them remember. And they're happy enough with that. They go home that night, they're watching television. She says that she would like a bowl of ice cream. And her husband says, okay, I can get you some ice cream. She says, write it down. This is ice cream I can remember. 
She says, well, put some strawberries on it. And he says, yeah, I got it. It's ice cream, strawberries, I'm fine. And she says, well, I'll have whipped cream too. And she says, you really better write that down. And now he's really irritated. He's like, strawberries, ice cream, whipped cream, I've got it. He grumbles all the way into the kitchen. He disappears for 20 minutes. He comes back and he hands her a plate of bacon and eggs. She is really annoyed now, and she says, I told you to write it down. You forgot my toast. <laughs> Those are the kind of little checklists that we all carry around in our minds that get us through the day. And those are the kind of memory problems that people with depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, early dementia, they all experience. This is looking at the size of that hippocampus. And one of the things you can see is there's a relation between the size of the hippocampus and the longer somebody has had depression. So you see the left and the right hippocampus and years of illness, and the hippocampus seems to be smaller for people who have been unwell for a long time. So unfortunately, in this case, it appears that size may really matter. <laughs> and as people have illness and the hippocampus gets smaller, they have difficulty with memory problems, but it's also harder for them to get well, and when they do get well, they're more at risk for getting sick again. We can look not only at the structure of the brain, so you saw structural slides with thickness and volume or slides. We can also now look at brain activity. And here it's represented as orangey red, and that orangey red means there's a lot of blood flow or a lot of activity in that region, and the blue you see means there's not much activity. It's underactive or hypoactive. What you're looking at here is young people who are in a scanner and they're performing a memory task while they're in the scanner and we're looking at activity in that hippocampus. And you can see the young people early in depression, they have a lot of activity, almost too much. So it's as though the hippocampus works but it's gotta go out and recruit the territory around it to be able to perform the task. The people who have had many years of depression in that instance, they don't have activity in that hippocampus. It's like they're unable to turn it on. And that's the group that has the significant memory impairment. And you might say, well, you know, that's a problem. Is there anything that you could do about that? And that would be a good question. So we took a group of patients who all had depression, about 100 of them. We put them in the MRI scanner and we looked at activity levels in their hippocampus. And then we brought them into clinic three or four times a week for 12 weeks or so, and we put them in front of a computer and we trained them on computer-based cognitive tasks to train up the memory. And we put them back into the scanner, and you may be able to just see that that little region called the hippocampus, there's some orangey red there, and that's increased activity in that hippocampus after training. It's not just that area of the brain where we can see activity patterns and measure them. And in fact, we can do that across a variety of brain regions. We can sum them together and we can get a signature of depression these days. What that means is I could take any one of you in this room right now, I could put you in an MRI scanner and I could teach the computer to estimate with almost 100% accuracy whether you are currently depressed or not. So it's a separate question whether we want to do that or believe as a society we should, <laughs> but the technology is available to us. You've all heard of the decade of the brain. We didn't cure much, but I would suggest to you that we are using brain science to change our understanding of mental illness, whatever we mean by that these days, to understand those illnesses as brain illness. And I think we no longer believe that schizophrenia arises as the result of bad mothering. We tend to not see depression as a characterological weakness anymore. And we are mostly agreed that an acutely manic person is not possessed and does not, in fact, require a therapeutic exorcism as a curative intervention. So we are slowly breaking down the walls of stigma. There are many reasons for that, but I would suggest one of the reasons is that brain science is helping us to reframe these conversations. 
it's as though we're shining a light on that wilderness, pushing back the frontier and helping people to understand where they are and how they got there. So a few minutes ago, you all closed your eyes and you imagined a wilderness, the wilderness of psychosis or a landscape of depression, but you were able to open your eyes and be back amongst all of us in this very vivid place. But right now, on the streets, not far away from us, in the hospitals just down the road, and possibly even in the house just beside yours, there is somebody who is out there lost still in that internal wilderness. And our goal is to give them a map. Thank you.